chapter number six. Now here in just a few minutes, it's going to be on the screen there for you. Here in just a second, Mark chapter number six, if you have a Bible, I like, uh, I like looking at the Bible, but for those that sometimes, those that may not have a Bible, we put it on the screen there for you. Uh, to help so you can follow along. Several verses. We'll start in verse number 14. We'll read down to about verse number 29 just to get the gist of the story. And then uh, we'll bring a few thoughts for your hearing this morning. Hopefully be a help and a blessing to you. In Mark chapter number 6, the story is about John the Baptist getting his head cut off. And uh, King Herod had his head cut off, and then Jesus shows up preaching, and so Herod thinks, oh my goodness, I thought we killed this guy, and it looks like John the Baptist has done a rose from the dead. He sounds just like him. So this sort of gives you the, the, the gist of the story. In verse number 14, and King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said, that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works did show forth themselves in him. Others said, that is a lie, others said, that is a prophet or one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it's John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold on John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Boy, what a sermon. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy and observed him. And, and when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to the Lord's high captain's chief uh, estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, whatsoever thou shalt ask, I will give thee unto half of my kingdom. She went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. <laughs> she must not like his sermon. <laughs> and she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry. Yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when the disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Let's go to the Lord in word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, this morning for allowing us to be here. I pray, Lord, you'd help us for the next little bit as we try to get something from your word. I pray, God, that it'll be helpful to the people, give uh, them something that they can glean from and help them throughout their week. I pray now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Here is a story, very odd story. Maybe you have heard of this guy named John the Baptist. Now, let me clear up something. Uh, John was called. He was the first one that showed up on the scene in Matthew. Nobody was baptizing anybody in the Old Testament. But then when John shows up, he wasn't a Baptist like what you saw on our sign. They called him John the Baptizer because he was the one that showed up. John didn't start the Baptist church, all that foolishness. He was the baptizer. He was the first one that come on the scene baptizing folks. And when he come on the scene baptizing folks, man, I'm telling you, John the Baptist was a preacher. He wasn't a politician. He wasn't, he wasn't preaching for a paycheck, a pension, or a parsonage. John the Baptist was a preacher. And if John the Baptist was living today, no church in Dyer County, Tennessee, or the United States would have him in the preach. <laughs> John the Baptist was a preacher. Matter of fact, he was the earthly cousin of Jesus Christ. 
John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus, and he was a cousin. Matter of fact, Jesus said this about John. If you don't like John, let me just tell you what Jesus said about him in the Bible. Matthew eleven eleven. Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said. He was a genuine preacher. The Bible says over there in Mark, we're in chapter 6, but if you would go over to Mark chapter 1 sometime, you would read where it says John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness. John the Baptist showed up to his people. The nation of Israel was sort of like uh, America is today. They were away from God. They might not have went known what bathroom to go into. Is everybody okay? Did I say something wrong? John the Baptist showed up uh, and he was preaching to his nation that was going down the wrong path. uh, And he said, hey, y'all need to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Boy, he was a preacher. And it was the voice of this preacher that aggravated a bunch of people. When John started preaching, I'm talking about he would go out there and a voice and he would, vo- his voice would carry and then people would say, man, we got to get rid of, we got to find some way to get rid of this preacher. I don't like what he's saying because what he's saying is true and I don't like what's true. But here's what it was. It wasn't the matter of the messenger. It wasn't John's voice. It was the voice of the Holy Spirit of God. I'll tell you what I mean. When I was growing up, I grew up in church. Man, my daddy was a preacher. I went to church nine months before I was born. I was almost born on the back row on a Wednesday night because dad says you got to go to prayer meeting first and then we have kids. And mama suffered through prayer meeting all through Wednesday night. True story. And after prayer meeting, Westside Baptist Church right here in town, after prayer meeting on a Wednesday night, mom went to the, here I was. But I had to wait till after prayer meeting was over on a Wednesday night. That's just the way it was. And my dad was a preacher. Man, I'm telling you, he'd get up there and preach. And man, he'd say, thus saith the Lord, you must be born again. And I'm sitting over there, uh, second row, piano side. And I'm uh, growing up in church. I didn't know Christ. I knew Christ, but I, uh, Christ wasn't living in me. And when I got to a certain age, and that, and that age is different from everybody, when I started these little ones now, it's what we call they're safe. But when they get older, the Holy Spirit of God starts dealing with them. And my dad was preaching, and I'm sitting over there, and I'm thinking to myself, man, i got to get out from under. There's something. This is the first time I've heard this and been bothered. Some, i I, I got to go to the bathroom. I said, Mom, i got to go to the bathroom. She said, you should have went through between Sunday school and preaching. As a rules. You had a break between Sunday school and preaching. You go to the bathroom then, get your drink of water then. I said, Mama, I got to go. I got to go. I went, man, every Sunday, man, I had to go to the bathroom, get a drink, something, man. Something was bothering me. And finally she said, Son, you ain't got a bathroom problem. You got a heart problem. There's something. And what I realized, it wasn't Daddy's voice. Because when Daddy hushed preaching, that voice followed me to the bathroom. That voice followed me to the water fountain. That voice found me at the bedroom. Way in the middle of the night, that voice would wake me up. Boy, you better get saved. You better get saved. You need to go to heaven when you... It wasn't daddy's voice. It was the voice that was being spoke through the word of God. And a lot of people say, well, if we just get rid of that preacher's voice, my friend, the voice of the Holy Spirit of God is going to follow you home. It's going to be in your car when you get in there. It'll be on your couch when you sit down on your couch in your recliner. The Holy Spirit of God will follow you wherever you go. Because it wasn't the voice of John the Baptist, but it was the voice of a convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God. 
Now, let me tell you this real quick. I mean, just give you just a few points. It was a voice. John's voice was a voice of revelation. You say, what was John's voice revealing? He was revealing that somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. Wake up, folks. Somebody's coming. And when he comes, he's mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. I'm baptizing you with water. But when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. I'm not worthy. He's greater than Saul. Solomon, he's greater than Jonah. He's greater than I am. He's greater than the greatest. He's better than the best. Stay in your seat. Don't get excited. But I'm just here to tell you. He said, that's who's coming and you better get ready. John said over there in John chapter number one, I think John one, one in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made. It was made. In him was life. And in him was life, the light of men. And then verse 6 says, and there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He wasn't the light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. You see, it wasn't John's voice that people had a problem with. It was, but it really wasn't because it was the Holy Spirit of God. Man, I remember growing up in church, I'd get under conviction, man. I didn't want to sit there. You know, I said, and then, and, and uh, we had all churches, you know, they growing up, man, an old uh, Trinity Baptist church, that old white church over there uh, 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 that, that sat over there just right on the other side of Hecathorn there, just an old white building there. And that's the church I grew up in and old wooden pews. And boy, I'd sit there and get under conviction. I think to myself, I'd get in about, about uh, eight, nine, 10 or so. And I said, if I, man, if I can just get out on that front porch uh, where them men are out there smoking and, um, and I'd get out there and I'd just, all I'd do, and just get a second hand, you know, just to calm my nerves. <laughs> but when I got out there on the front porch and I got my little second hand, the Holy Spirit of God started working through that smoke. And he said, I'm still out here with you among the smoke. <laughs> so I got rid of daddy's voice, but the Holy Ghost followed me out on the front porch. It was a voice that was crying in the wilderness. John was pointing people to Jesus. John didn't say, hey, come touch my robe. John didn't say, come follow my website. John wasn't selling flask of Jordan water. John wasn't selling books. Buy my next book, How to Be a Better You. <laughs> I'll tell you how to be a better you. You want to buy a book for it. Get saved. He was pointing people. He wasn't a politician. He was pointing people right to Jesus Christ. He was a voice. Revelation. But let me go on and say this. Not only was a voice of revelation, but number two is a voice of repentance. Now, a lot of churches don't like repentance and preaching on repentance. But over in John, uh, Matthew chapter 3, there was uh, John showed up preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And this is what his sermon was. Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it said he was a voice crying in the wilderness, repent, repent, make your way past straight uh, for he's coming. He's our Messiah. Trust him. Hallelujah. Repent. Over there in Acts 17, verse 30, it says, God commandeth every man to repent. Amen. You say, preacher, what is repentance? It's a change of heart, mind, and attitude. I'll give you, for instance, a real simple example. You're sitting here reading your Bible, and you're doing something in your life you ain't supposed to, and you know you ain't supposed to, and all of a sudden you're reading your Bible, and all of a sudden the Bible tells you you ain't supposed to. Amen. Repentance is saying, okay, God, that's what you think about it. So I'm going to change my mind, heart, and attitude, and I'm going to get. I'm going. I'm going to start. I'm going to start believing what your word says. Yes. Quit doing what I'm doing, and follow your word. You see how quiet it started getting in here. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. I'll give you another, maybe a Bible example will help you a little better. Over there in Luke chapter number 18, prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son? Prodigal son went to his daddy and said, hey, give me all my inheritance. I'm leaving this place. I'm tired of church. I'm tired of y'all preaching to me all the time. I'm going. And I'm going out here and I'm going to live it up. He goes out there and live it up. He's in the hog pen. 
And the Bible says he's done lost all. When you lose all your money, you lose all your friends. And he lost all his friends. He's now working for a, for a pig farmer. He done got him in the pig pen. And the Bible says when he came to himself, <laughs> changed his heart, mind, and attitude. He's like, God, man, you was right about this whole deal. He dropped the pail, jumped the rail, hit the trail, and come back on home <laughs> to his father. He changed his mind, went, got out of the hog pen, quit doing what he was doing, and went back home to the father. John was preaching that kind of repentance. But not only is a voice of revelation, a voice of repentance, but then it was a voice of rebuke. Oh, pe pe people don't like to be preached to on rebuking. I'll give you, for instance, we just read a few minutes ago. Man, when John, when John started preaching, he didn't back off, back down, and he didn't back out. It didn't, matter, it didn't matter if the mayor walked in, he wasn't going to change his sermon. It didn't matter if the governor walked in, he wasn't going to change his sermon. He didn't matter if the banker walked in with all the money in the whole world, going to plan on putting it in the offering. John didn't change his sermon one bit. Matter of fact, let me just tell you what kind of rebuke. Let me just tell you about John. Let me tell you why he wouldn't work in a lot of churches. Because Herod, King Herod, came to hear him preach one Sunday morning. And brought his brother's wife with him. Did he, did he, you know, y'all with me? That's pretty brave. Man, John got up there. He didn't change his message. Right in front of everybody. He said, King Herod, it ain't right for you to be living with your brother's wife. Repent. Get right. Boy, everybody. Everybody started doing the Baptist salute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Boy, it's time to go now. <laughs> and Herodias, Herodias is sitting there. Yes. Now, Herod took it pretty good. Yes. He said, I, hey, that's the preacher. He's, he's telling it right. I ain't planning on doing nothing about it, but he's telling it right. Herodias says, I can't kill him because Herod likes him. But there come a day when Herod's birthday and he looked at Herodias, his daughter. He said, I tell you what, I'll give you anything you want today, up to half of my kingdom. She didn't know what to ask for. She went to mama. She said, hey, what's that? what do I need to ask for? She said, I want the head of John the Baptist for that sermon he preached, that voice. That voice that's been bothering me ever since we walked out of that service that morning. That preacher, I tell you what, I want to get rid of him, cut his head off. They went back to Herod and says, hey, mama wants the head of John the Baptist. <laughs> the preacher, John the Baptist. And boy, they, hey, that charger. Now, I didn't know they had vehicles back then, but um, <laughs> some of you were asleep. You had to be woke up, okay? So they sent an executioner. They cut John's head off. They put it on one of them chargers, put the lid on top of it. That's what they're talking about. And they brought it in there to King Herod, pulled the lid off of the top of that thing. And there's John's head. And the voice is quiet until Jesus showed up. And he's preaching just like John was. Matter of fact, the verses we read when King Herod heard Jesus was preaching, he said, man, that John the Baptist, he doesn't come up out of the grave. That's that same John I beheaded. He sounds just like he's preaching the same message. He's got the same voice. I'm talking about a voice of revelation, a voice of repentance, a voice of rebuke. Hey, you can ignore the message. You can attack the preacher. I've always said it like this. Look, I'm just a mailman. Don't get mad at the mailman. Just pay your bills. <laughs> if the mailman brings you a bill, don't cut, the, don't, don't cut the mailman's head off. He's just bringing the mail. Don't get mad at the preacher. I'm just bringing the mail. Where's my Pentecostal side? <laughs> Woo! I'm just delivering the mail. And sometimes it hits me too. 
Boy, Jesus started coming. I'm telling you what, he was going after it and preaching. And, and uh, that Bible says, now listen, that Bible says we confess our sins. He's faithful and just. Forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a voice of revelation, a voice of repentance, a voice of rebuke. But then it was a voice of retribution. A voice of retribution. Man, when John was preaching, man, they cut his head off. But when they cut his head off, it didn't cool the flames of hell any. When they cut John's head off, it didn't make God any less God. When they cut John's head off, it didn't make Jesus any less Jesus. Because you can get rid of the messenger, but you can't get rid of the voice of God. Amen. The voice of God. It's a voice of retribution. Boy, they cut his head off. Boy, no more preaching. Boy, we can cancel church. No more preaching. And man, it wasn't the next day they heard somebody crying out there on the wheel, repent for the kid. And they looked out, there's Jesus. Preaching the same thing. They said, man, we ain't going to never get rid of. Listen, they've been preaching. They've been trying to get rid of preaching for a long time. If y'all, if y'all not notice that. Are we not facing a day and time right now to where we're trying to quiet the church down, trying to shut the Bible, trying to quiet? If a preacher posts something, now the Taliban can post anything they want to on Facebook, but if a preacher says, get saved, Jesus Christ, all the way to heaven, they'll shut you down. Something wrong with that. Why? They're trying to quiet the voice. But I got news for you. You can quiet the voice off Facebook, but that voice is going to follow you to the house. Right. Amen. Amen. Have I got time to give you a little illustration? You know, right up here, this pulpit, this is where my Bible's laying right here. This is truth. This is truth right here. And there was a day, there was a day when the church stood right beside the truth. There was a day when the church stood right by the truth. And then along come the world, and the world always don't want anything to do with the truth. So they move here. And then the the world starts persecuting the church, and the church, instead of sticking with the word, they just move to here. And then the world goes down to here. And then the world, the church says, well, let's go here. We're separate from the world, but you're getting away from the truth. Okay. And then the world, all right, some of you not getting it. Okay. Let me, let me, anybody remember the first cuss word that ever came across the television? I'll help you. Gone with the wind. Anybody remember? Gone with the wind. It's the first cuss word that ever come across the television screen. And, uh, and, and, and then the church was, well, the church was standing right here when that cuss word come out. I can tell you what it was, but the one you're thinking is probably good enough. <clears throat> First cuss word to come out. The world moved over here. And then first, and the church just went, oh, the Lord's come. The Lord's about to come back. I just heard something on the television I ain't never heard before in my life. And the church finally settled down about that. It wasn't but one cuss word. And then the church moved on out here. And the church, and the church, the world moved on out there. And then the church says, well, I just hate missing all them good shows. I mean, they only say one or two. Come on, come on. Come on. That's right, amen. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Y'all watch TV lately? <laughs> we wished the only thing we heard was gone with the wind. 
I'll give you another example. Y'all, y'all don't, you, you look like you're liking this, okay? Um, anybody, anybody remember uh, the uh, I Love Lucy show? I Love Lucy. I, I don't even know if they were Christians or not. It didn't make any difference as far as what my illustration goes. But uh, I Love Lucy. I used to watch, of course, back in, the, back in my day when I uh, grew up in a preacher's home. If it wasn't in black and white, you couldn't watch it. That stuck me with I Love Lucy, Leave It to Beaver, Andy Griffin. And you know what? It's about right. (laughs) I Love Lucy. Now, think think with your mind. How many I Love Lucy friends we got? Fans. Look at there, all over there. All right, watch. This is Hollywood now. It's Hollywood. Hollywood. When you went in the bedroom of, of Ricky and Lucy... They were married in real life. Yeah. But when you went in the bedroom on Ricky and Lucy's show, oh, they had. Two yep. 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 Because back then the world was scared right. of the voice. And now the world's done move way on out here. <laughs> and the church ain't too far behind them. We're over here, and the church says, well, we ain't with the world. Come on. Come on. Amen. That's right. We're not with the world. Come on. But turn around and look how far we are from the truth. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, I would tell you about the... You know, I ain't got time to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> My sister would kill me if I told you about that. <clears throat> but used to, used to the bathing suit. Y'all remember the bathing suits a long time ago in the fifties and sixties? Man, they went plumb all the way down to the ankle. And then they started creeping up. The longer you go, they started creeping up, and they started showing the calf. And now they show the whole cow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now have I got everybody's attention? Have we made our point? Now we laugh about it. I want you to laugh about it, but you see where the devil has. Now, let me finish, let me finish the sermon. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, you don't have to turn here, but I'm going to go to Luke 23. I'm going to read these verse 6 through 9. Watch this very carefully. Now watch very carefully, and I'm closing in a minute. Jesus has been arrested. They're fixing to crucify Jesus. Jesus has preached just like John. They cut John's head off, and now they're fixing to crucify Jesus. Watch. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man was... A Galilean. Pilate was trying to get him off of his hands and get him on to somebody else. As soon as he knew he belonged under Herod's Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at the time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly exceedingly glad for he was desirous to see him for a long time because he had heard many things of him and he Hope to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words. But Jesus answered him nothing. Now here's the close of the sermon. God sends a voice. A voice crying in the wilderness. Repent. If you ain't right with God, you need to get right with God, and you probably know it. There's stuff you need to get right, stuff you need to get right, get on this altar, get it right, get it under the blood, get it clean, and God will send you a voice. And you may even try to cut the preacher's head off, but that voice, man, here comes another one. Here comes a voice, and that voice will follow you at the house. 
He'll follow you down the road. He'll be driving down the road, and you'll be thinking about the sermon, and, 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 and you think it's my fault, but it's the voice of God that's on the inside. I mean, I'm not in your car. The God is. And he's convicting, and he's showing. And Jesus comes on and says, hey, won't you get saved? Won't you get saved? Please come. The Lord's not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There come a day when you walk out and say, No. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Now let me, let me, let me say something. I know, I know, you know, some people are hindered and all that kind of stuff, but some people will come. And then they won't come back for about a month because they're trying to get over the. And they come back and that voice starts at them again. Every time they come, that voice gets at them. Lord, would you please? I, I can't even go to church in peace. Leave me alone. And there will come a day when you walk in church. And he won't say a word. That's it. Oh, I never want to get to the place where God can't speak to me. Oh, how sad. And people walk out day after day after day. I don't know how many times God's long suffering. I don't know. But there will come a day like this. Jesus had an opportunity. And he said, I ain't going to say nothing. If you ain't listened by now, he answered him nothing. The voice, go. I'll tell this illustration. You see how we do you? I got one more illustration. <laughs> It's a long time. It's several, several years ago. Some of you may can correct me on this. I don't even know if they still do that. But we went to Niagara Falls on the, on the Canadian side. And uh, we were singing. This has been 20-something years ago and, uh, or longer. And, and we're there. And you always, and, and always want to take the tour, Niagara Falls, you know, all this kind of stuff. And uh, Niagara Falls, all that water. And you take a tour, and they, they take you in. This dude, he's got a sort of little headset like mine, and he's got a little, you know, microphone there, and he's, you know, he's talking. And you sort of have to because once you get, and they go in around that water, man, it's loud. I don't know if you've ever been, but it's loud. All that water's coming in, and they tell you how many gallons is coming over a minute, and da-da-da-da. And you're almost having, if you're talking to the person next to you, you're almost having to holler to them because it's so loud. And this guy, he's got a mic because you couldn't hear him if he didn't have he, if he didn't have a microphone. It was just loud. And uh, do this tour. I don't know how long the tour was, 30, 40 minutes. I don't know. And they tell you all kind of facts and, and this, that, and the other. And uh, I just got to wondering because it's bugging me. And I asked the guy, the tour guide guy, after it was all over, I said, hey, can I ask you something? I said, how many of these you do a day? He said, oh, we do about 10. We'll take turns, and we'll do one, and we'll take a break while somebody else is doing one. And throughout the day, it's probably about 10 we do. Take these tours down through there. And I said, does this ever bother you? He said, yeah, when I first started, it did. But the more you do it, the quieter it gets. You don't pay no attention to it no more. The more you hear it, he said, if you did this every day, you hear this all the time, you get used to it. People here preaching and preaching and preaching. First time they ever heard preaching, boy, he's like, oh, my God. They've been in church and church and church, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and now it's where they, they won't give in, they won't... And all of a sudden, they come in, and they done got used to it. It don't bother them no more. Same as coming to the piano. Let me ask you something. Is that voice, that voice talking to you? He's talking to Jensen. It's 
the Lord speaking to you? You say, preacher, if you'd just hush, we'd go to, we'd go to lunch. We fix to say amen here in a minute and close, go home. I promise you this, it ain't my voice that's bothering you. Come on. There you go. That voice is going to get in the car with you and go yeah. to Grecian with you. Going to go to Taco Bell with you. Going to go to Sonic with you. Right. Wherever else you're going. He's going to get in the car and go with you. If you've never heeded the voice. You say, preacher, I'm saved. Well, it might be something in your life that you still need to get just right between you and God. He's been talking to you about it a long time, and you just hadn't done anything about it. Amen. I want you to stand to your feet. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to invite you to come to this altar and pray. Whatever it is, just come and pray. And if you don't need to pray about anything else, I, I would like some men of our church to come and pray. Pray for that we make the right decision on, on whatever we do as far as our building, 